So we're here uh, with uh, Dr. Martin Wilson. He is a history professor at East Stroudsburg University. We're here to have a conversation about the Delaware Water Gap and the importance of it to the Poconos. Marty, why the name Delaware Water Gap? Like, where did that name come from? Well, I think, again, from the geological formation. You know, you got the Delaware River, hence Delaware, water, the river, going through this gap in the mountains. And it's, you know, it's an unusual geological formation. So I, I assume that's where the name came from. I don't know anything other than that concerning the name. So who were the earliest settlers that kind of, for lack of a better term, discovered it? Well, uh, the Minnesink, which is that area north of the Delaware Water Gap along the river, was a fairly active Lenny Lenape settlement. Uh, the first Europeans to come into the area were probably uh, the 1650s. They came down from the Hudson River because that was part of New Netherlands. You know, New Amsterdam was founded in 1620s along the Hudson River. So the people into the area came down, first Europeans into the area came down from the Hudson River and they saw Indians wearing copper trinkets. And so they found out where the copper came from and that drew them to this area. You know about the copper mines over in New Jersey? Yeah, and weren't they, they, were, uh, they were actually mined for about 30 or 40 years, correct? Yeah, yeah, the, the history of the mines, I'm not real clear if they were mined for a while and then they were closed down and then somebody else tried to open it up later and it didn't work out, I'm not sure exactly. So some of the actions of that infrastructure are still even there, correct? Yeah, some pieces yeah. of it. So uh, is this when Duteau actually came to the region? No, Duteau didn't come until 1793. What happened is, Duteau was from what we call Haiti today. It's the western third of the island of Hispaniola, which was a French uh, colony. They grew sugar mostly, but co uh, coffee and other things. Anyway, 1791, the slaves rose up in rebellion and started slaughtering every white person they could find. Duteau, we know, was a plantation owner, but we don't know how many, we don't even know if he owned slaves, to be quite frank, but he probably did. So anyway, he fled, came to Philadelphia. The story goes, he ran into Stephen Gerard. Stephen Gerard had contacts in that, with that island because he was a trader. Uh, and Stephen Gerard said, well, you ought to head north. Uh, 1793, by the way, there was a yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia. It would make sense to me that if a guy like Duteau, who's a young man at that point, probably had some money, it would make sense the reason why he didn't stay in Philadelphia in 1793 was because of the yellow fever epidemic. Anyway, he comes north and he buys the land just above the water gap along the river there. So that's 1793 when, when Duteau came. So what, what was his, uh, what did he really do here in 1793? Was there a reason why he came here? Did he see opportunity? He wanted to build a town on the river. Now, I, I've always heard it referred to as an inland city. I don't know city, a <laughs> big word city, you know. But he wanted to build this inland town and he actually built a number of buildings and he set aside a little triangle piece of ground for a square. The thing is, you know, the area had already been kind of settled. I mean, uh, the, the Broadheads were already here, the Pew was already here, the 1720s. So people had been around for decades at that point. But nobody had really settled right on the river. And I often thought Duteau saw that as an opportunity because the rivers were the highways of the time. Right. You know? So I'm thinking, you want to have connection to Philadelphia, you want to be close to the river. So uh, anyway, he came and he didn't know how to make a living here. So he looked for minerals. Maybe there's something in the mountains that you can mine. Didn't have any luck with that. Uh, he was running through any money that he had brought with him, but he's looking around at the scenery and he's thinking, this might be my meal ticket, right? Maybe I can make some money by bringing tourists into the area to enjoy this. So he starts building the Kittatinny House, what later becomes the Kittatinny House. He ran out of money, sold it to a guy named Samuel Snyder in 1832, and then Snyder opened it up as the Kittatinny, and that starts the resort industry really in the Poconos. So really kind of that's when the Delaware water gap started to grow. And well, I think if you think of the Poconos as a resort destination, it starts in Delaware Water Gap. That's the, that's, you know, I think, the, I think of that as, as the epicenter, Delaware Water Gap. That's where the first big hotels were and all the other hotels sprung up after that. So the bigger hotels that were in Delaware Water Gap, what were they? Well, the Kittatinny was the biggest. And then the Water Gap House, which up on top of the hill behind it, uh, was another huge hotel. 
Uh, and then the Castle Inn, which still stands today, uh, came along much later. Uh, those, and, and the Glenwood, those were probably the four biggest. And the Glenwood still stands, that's a brick building. The reason the Castle Inn still stands is because it's a cement building. The only one of the hotels that still stands that was wood is the Deerhead Inn itself, which was the, was the central house back then. We were talking a little bit about anthracite in, in this overall region. Yeah. So how do you feel anthracite really helped or detracted from this region because it's so close, being Hazleton being so close and yeah. not that far away, and Carbon County, of course. We had touched a little bit on anthracite, but um, uh, it's interesting about how that whole way of life just blossomed here, of course, with the, with the material here. Well, you know, the history of the anthracite region is a fascinating history. You told me you grew up in Hazleton. Uh, if I were to connect this area to the anthracite region, I would say that it was a place where immigrants who were looking for jobs in the anthracite region, they got off the boat in New York and they came on the train through this region and they went to the anthracite region. And the reason that this region d developed was because of the railroad, which was created because of the anthracite industry. I think I found, uh, we were doing some research and we found the life of Asa Packer very fascinating that in, in this same time period that he was one of the richest men in America with, right. along with the Vanderbilts and um, some of the other names that, that, that would come up. He was actually in the top five of the richest people in the United States yeah. and left quite a legacy, but yet he's fairly unknown. Well, of course, Lehigh University, Asa Packer, the whole thing right. he built it in the Asa right. Packer uh, uh, Auditorium or whatever it is. Uh, but he made his money just transporting the coal, you know, and that's where you made your money in anthracite, by transporting right. it, not, not by mining it. Right. In your estimation, what were the, the heyday years? What were the golden years? I would say the heyday was maybe 1870s up through the 19-teens, something like that. The, the railroad was the key to Delaware Water Gap. Once once cars come along in great numbers after the 20s and then into the 1930s, uh, the, the heyday of Water Gap's passed. You know, it's, it's moved on to other parts of the Poconos, but, but Water Gap never recovered from it. And I had read that um, a lot of the larger properties that are like the Kinnatini Inn actually burned down and were never rebuilt. Yeah, we have to re uh, you have to remember something, Chris. Those were all winter, uh, summer-only hotels. They closed down in the fall. I think it's coincidental that in, it was November of 1915 that the Water Gap House burned down. So at the end of the season, they're closing it down. Uh, it was October, I think, I might have the months incorrect or reversed, but 1931 that the Kittatinny burned down. So both again at the end of the season. Uh, yeah, so those two hotels, once they burned down, you know, it's especially the the the, the Kittatinny. It's the, it's the depression. You know, so they weren't going to be rebuilt. It was right at the start of the. It's the depression, and cars now are plentiful, and people don't need to stay at those big hotels. And you know, another thing that changed, Chris, is people used to take vacations for the season. You know, people from New York. You, it, it's hard for us to imagine what life must have been like before air conditioning, you know? And we talked about that, uh, or we were talking about that a little bit before we actually came on here, but if, why would people want to leave the cities, I guess was probably the first thing I should ask. And um, was it because there was no air conditioning in the cities, they weren't sanitary? Is that one of the reasons? You can imagine, uh, 95 degree heat in New York City with garbage strewn, and, and keep in mind that the streets were still not paved, lots and lots of horses, as many as 100,000 horses as late as 19 teens. It was a dirty, smelly, uncomfortable place to be. So, I, so people that could afford it would just ship the whole family off to a place like the Kittatinny for the season. And the father would come out on Friday night on the train and go back Monday morning to the city uh, to work, leaving the family out here. So the father, what type of, of occupation would that father have had? Yeah, well, they would not have been working class, certainly. They would have been, and they wouldn't have been the upper classes either, because the upper classes went to Bar Harbor and they had their own places. But let's call them upper middle class, so lawyers, middle management, that, those kinds of things. So it was an up and coming kind of yeah. destination? Yes. And we, we talked about this a little bit too, if 
how did they make reservations before oh, the yeah, phone yeah. and the telegraph? That, that's an interesting question. I don't know. The telegraph existed, certainly, and the telegraph always followed the rail lines, and there was a telegraph office in Delaware Water Gap, but I've never read anything about that. Of course, they, they could have written letters, and I suspect that's mostly how it was done. I, I was reading um, on your website uh, some the, the history of, of Delaware Water Gap, and one of the things that was really, really interesting was that there were some newspapers that published yeah, the, the guest lists, oh, which oh, I yeah, thought yeah, was interesting. Yeah. Why yeah. was that? You wanted to know who was in town. I mean, it, it's not the kind of vacationing that we do today, you know? You wanted to know who was in town. You wanted to know if you met the people that you met two years ago were in town. or So it was a different thing than it is today. I can't imagine that kind of a thing happening at a place like this. So at the, at the heyday that we, you just described and, and outlined for us, what would be some of the things that a family would do? They're staying there the whole summer. So what would be the activities that they would engage in throughout that three or four month period? Okay, well, let's start lower and work up. Low meaning the river. I mean, they're going to certainly spend time at the river. Uh, they're going to swim in the river. They're going to boat on the river. So there are a lot of waterborne activities. Uh, there were lots of trails, and they still exist. Uh, in Delaware Water Gap, part of part of the Appalachian Trail is on you know on these trails. Uh, they would go out and contemplate nature. They would sit on the verandas of those big old hotels with these beautiful views. You know, one thing that intrigues me about those vacationers is whenever you see photographs of them, they're dressed to the nines. You know, the women have long dresses on and blouses, and the men have suits and ties and hats. And I'm talking about up in the woods, so they're hiking in those, that kind of clothing. So I think for them, coming out of the city, this was a big deal. They want to show that they've sort of made it into the upper middle class or middle class at least, and, and that's the way you dress. This is a big deal going out and uh, they didn't drink a lot, you know. They, they, it depends on the time period, but a lot, the, there weren't many hotels that had alcohol at the time. In the 1870s, 1880s, later on they did. But I think part of why they came was nature. I mean, they're coming from an urban area. Their lives are tied up in urban. And they come out here and they see trees and they see the... I, I think it was just a, a religious experience for them. And I mean, mean that in the sense that uh, urbanites, it's easy to imagine that urbanites saw when they came out to nature, the hand of God, that kind of thing. So. I think it was almost, it sounds silly to say, but sort of serious business for them, this vacation and stuff. So if uh, one of these families stayed at the Kittatinny Inn for the summer, how much would something like that cost? Uh, that's days? a good question. I have seen the rates. Uh, depends on the years, you know, maybe $5 a week per person. Uh, Did that include meals? Yeah, and... that would include meals. They all had, they all advertised, you know, uh, milk from cows that we have on the grounds. Uh, vegetables that we grow in our own farm. You know, they all that was fascinating. Yeah. One of the things I saw in your write-up was farm. The f it wasn't termed this way, but it was very early farm-to-table. Like right yeah. now, we have a lot of resorts that really say, you know, hey, we have farm-to-table. It's locally sourced. Well, that was happening then. Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it would have cost them. Uh, I, I can't imagine it was very expensive, though. But. So now the city, or the town, I'm sorry, town itself of Delaware Water Gap, what was that like when the resorts were in full operation, say in June and July? Yeah. How about the people who live there? How did they feel about the, the Delaware Water Gap? Yes, well, you know, you're talking about a town of maybe 700 people, depending, right? And then, and then at the height of the season, maybe 2,500 people in, in the town. Uh, on... A nice day, the, the streets of that tiny little borough were packed with people walking up and down. Uh, the local people, I have never read anything suggesting they resented these people coming in. As a matter of fact, you know, they made their living from these people, a lot of them. Uh, uh, there was a guy named Casey Drake. Casey grew up and he was born in 1903. He grew up in Water Gap. Uh, and he told me before he died, you know, we used to talk a lot about this. He died when he was in his late 80s, several years ago, but his family lived in a, in a little house that still exists on Oak Street. And in the summertime, they would rent out their house and live in a tent in the backyard. 
to people, they would rent it out to people from New York City who came up there and rented the house for the entire summer. Their name was Aunt, the Hom, Hammer family from New York City. They were importers and exporters. They, the Hammer family later built a house in Delaware Water Gap, which coincidentally I happen to own. It's where I live right oh, now. That's, oh, that's yeah. interesting. But uh, Casey tells the story about how his mom took in laundry from these guests at the hotels, at the Kittatinny and the Water Gap house. And the first summer they did it, now picture this, they're living in a tent in the backyard and there's just grass on them. It's not, you know, it's just a tent. And it rained the whole summer. And her, his poor mom's doing this laundry in this tent and hanging it up, trying to get it to dry wow. inside the tent. <laughs> wow. But, you know, that they made their living from, uh, you know, a lot of them made a good part of their living from the, the hotel guests. So they were very entrepreneurial yeah, back sure. then. Yeah, wow. sure. Oh, and another thing, you know, they he rented out, his father rented out the whole house, but people would... But, you know, if they had a room, they would rent it out. I mean, we, we, we always talk about the big hotels, but a lot of people would just rent out a room. Kind of like a B&B, I guess, like today. But. I, I mean, it's uh, people think it's a new concept, but apparently it really wasn't. As the decline started, how did the population of the town go down? And it, I, I saw one comment that you had made. Would, it seemed like the folks at uh, Delaware Water Gap were kind of content to let that era pass them by. And... And, and let the Poconos kind of really start to resurge as a resort area. Yeah, I think one of the saving graces of the town of Delaware Water Gap, from my perspective, because I live there and I love the town, is that it never developed. It, once cars came along and the railroad was not as critical for bringing guests, the, the, the tourism industry spread out amongst around the Poconos more. The, the town of Water Gap went through a decades of sort of decline there wasn't a whole lot going on there but it became this very nice kind of community uh, that's limited by space geographically so it can never we can never have like big huge hotels there anymore or, or things like this which I think the people that live in Water Gap are happy about it's become more or less a sort of a bedroom community for Stroudsburg, sort of a suburb for Stroudsburg, if that makes sense. And of course, a lot of people live and work in New York City, live there and work in New York City. I think one of the things that we talked about um, that was very interesting is how did the Delaware Water Gap, the federal management, recreate the recreation area? How did that happen now? Because that's part of the history too. Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, let me say this. The Delaware Water Gap is that geological formation. When, when the railroad comes through, the, the town of Dutoesburg, named after Antoine Duteau, changed their name to capitalize on it because people in New York City knew it. So now we fast forward 100 years or whatever it is, and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is going to build a dam across the Delaware River about three miles north of Shawnee at a place called Tox Island. And they're going to back up the water all the way up the Delaware uh, Valley to Milford, a 30-some mile long lake. Uh, they bought up all the land, kicked people off, uh, incurring lifelong anger against the Park Service that still exists to this day. And uh, people started to protest, a lot of different people from a lot of different angles. It's kind of a complex story, but the long and short of it is that they ended up not building the dam. Now they have this land that they had kind of set aside for recreation anyway. It was one of the things that the Tox Island Dam was going to provide, recreation. So they just uh, turn it into a national recreation area. So for you and I, that's a good thing because, you know, as I was saying earlier, we get to use it. Uh, if it was still in private hands, you know, as well as I do, there'd be condominiums up and down that river, at least in parts. So, so the national recreation area came about because of this failed Talks Island. And thousands of people enjoy it every year. And people, yes, right. I think it's. I think I read somewhere it's one of the most visited because it's so close to New York City. It is. Yeah, they, it's incredible. One thing is uh, uh, Duto Museum. Can, can you talk just a little bit about that? But before we yes, go. the Duto Museum was a. It's a. It's in a school that was built in the 1800s. I don't have the exact date. Let's say 1850s, something like that. Uh, it was a four-room schoolhouse, and it closed in 1969. My cousin, who's a year younger than me, went there. Uh, that year, a group of local citizens from Water Gap formed the SOS Save Our School Committee and they petitioned the school board to give it to the borough for a dollar or something like that. And then the SOS committee decided to use it for community betterment. Uh, at one point there was a library in there. They always had 
thought, uh, talk about putting a museum in, bringing artifacts in. So it's kind of morphed from that into the Duto Museum. Upstairs we have two rooms dedicated to the museum, the, the history of the resorts, and downstairs we have a revolving art show every summer. Now the Duto Museum is only open, you know, from May to October. You know, it's, it's only in the summertime, and it's all volunteer. But it's a very active museum. We have a very active group of people involved in that museum. Well, we want to uh, we want to encourage everyone to visit that. We were very lucky today to have uh, Marty Wilson, Dr. Wilson history professor at East Strasburg University to tell us a little bit about the Delaware Water Gap and some of the great history of the Pocono Mountains. I'm Chris Barrett for Dr. Wilson for Pocono Perspectives. Thanks for watching.